for lifting us up and placing our feet on solid ground. It's preaching time. Will you pray with me? God, I hope I heard you and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. And then, oh God, help me live what I preach and practice what I preach. Believe what I preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Tremaine Hawkins asked this question, what must I do? What shall I do? What steps should I take? What moves should I make? Oh, Lord, what shall I do? And then the R&B lyrical theologians known as DeBarge even asked, what can I do? And declare time will reveal that special love that is deep inside of us. Beloved, wouldn't life be much easier if we didn't have to make decisions? Would life, wouldn't it be grand if we didn't have to make choices? Wouldn't life be just perfect if we didn't have to make decisions and choices and take responsibility for our decisions and choices? We've got a big decision and choice to make on November 5th. I hope it's not that difficult, but we still have to make a choice. What do you believe in the most? What do you trust the most? And whom do you trust? Just be honest. And... When that trust and hope is broken, what happens to you? What choices do you have to make? What moves do you have to make? What must you do? It is our decisions and choices that we face some of the most challenging and, and that poses some of the greater competing loyalties. Is my job more important than my commitment that I've made to serve? Is my abusive spouse more important than my Wholeness. Are my children more important than my relationship with God? Is my clout, my status, my car more important than the kingdom? Can I have my cake and eat it too? And we are especially conflicted when it comes to choosing Jesus the Christ in our lives. We would much rather do our thing than to strive to live as best we can a life that concerns itself for others. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated this way, quote, that pity may represent little more than the impersonal concern which prompts the mailing of a check. But true sympathy is the personal concern which demands the giving of one's soul, close quote. Jesus was so concerned for us that he gave his life and we can't show enough concern for each other because we got stuff going on and don't have time or we believe and trust lies of a, uh, and trust in the lies of an ego, maniacal, insecure, reprobate liar whose sole purpose is to steal, kill, destroy, divide, and conquer. Let me just say, Say that time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth unmoved can stand. So you better build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. And when I see how the conflicts within seems to match the conflicts on the outside. What I find amazing is how folks think they can fake the funk. Can I tell you a secret? If I can tell you are struggling, don't you know God knows? God gives me this gift of discerning spirits and I can read most folks like a book. And some folks come up saying certain things that they, they know fully well the intentions might be well, but you're struggling. I would rather be you be honest with yourself than to have conflicting emotions and competing loyalties. And we depend on you and then you don't do it because you're competing with the responsibilities and other commitments. Can we just keep it real? And the best Ebonics that I can muster up to break it down, ain't no half-stepping in the kingdom. Either you is or you ain't. What is it that's got a hold on you so tightly that it keeps you from loving and serving God with your whole heart, soul, and mind? What are you thinking about right now that has you conflicted? What keeps you up stressing and struggling the past few days, even last night, where you had to resort to the final question, Lord? What must I do? Is it really that important when you think about it? What happens when that which you think you can't live without breaks down, breaks away, breaks off, breaks loose, breaks out, breaks through, breaks free from you? How will you handle your little world that's now breaking up? I declare both Tremaine Hawkins and Elder Barge must have read the text for today where the prevailing question is asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The man in the text without a name, but has been given an adjectival descriptor as the rich young ruler. 
His brother thought he had it all together. He had kept all the Ten Commandments and some. He looked perfect to his buddies. He was perfect in his mind. He had it going on. The brother was tight. What I can't understand, since in his own mind, he knew he was all of that in a bag of chips, just like a pickle with a nine later in the middle. Why in the world would he need to ensure his perfections registered with Jesus? Since he was perfect, why did he need Jesus to validate him? Maybe his buddies were telling him, you ain't never done anything wrong. You don't have anything to worry about to get into heaven. You never missed church. You never lied. You never stole a stamp from work. You never ate a grape in a grocery store. You never had a dirty thought in your mind. You've never had premarital sex. You never killed anyone or stolen anything. You know the scriptures, man. You got it made. So even with all the stuff that made him rich, young, and a ruler, he was still insecure about his place in eternity. All of the accommodations and plaudits were not enough for this rich, young ruler who's only known by the adjectives rich, young ruler, which suggests he spent much of his time with the prosperity gospel mentality. Maybe probably watch Creflo Dollar and Joel Osteen pimping God for the traffics of prosperity rather than praising God for grace. Lord have mercy. You know what I can't understand is how folks never proof text this pericope. Why come folks can quote Leviticus 18 and 22 about sexual relations or John 14 and 6, the way, the truth, and the life of 1 Peter 3 and 1 about submission, but never ever do we hear any highly religious folks say, give all you got to the poor. All the com com commendations and plaudits were not enough for the rich young ruler, who's only known by the adjectives rich, young, and ruler, which suggests that he spent all of his time on this prosperity mentality. Can I break it down? The adjectives rich, young, ruler. Rich was the measure of his success. Young in the sense that he is immature in the faith. Ruler as one who is always in control. A type personality, a control freak, freak had always to be in large and in charge, arrogant, interjecting questions and comments when he should be listening. Listen, you really don't have to talk all the time. My daddy used to say, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Let that dangle in your spirit. So thus we have this rich young ruler. Can you see him in you? Anybody ever cared enough to ask the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or do you even care? Well, here's what I love about Jesus. When we think we are so perfect, there's always something missing. That's why we need to travel back down in history to wonder why this wonderful man who is indeed walked this earth to complete us, to show us that we don't have it all together. Jesus tells this rich young ruler point blank, one thing you lack, one thing you don't have, Mr. or Miss Perfect, is this. Go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. The brother was crushed. He didn't want to hear that. He probably preferred Jesus singing his praises because he had stuff and he never did anything rather than tell him what you have to do to inherit eternal life. Beloved, be careful what you ask Jesus because you might not be able to handle the answers. But for those who are wanting to move away from the characteristics of being rich, young, and a ruler, the wealthy and healthy in spirit, mature in faith, and a co-conspirator in the kingdom, here's what I know. These competing loyalties, all that stuff you know you think you got to have and can't do without. If you truly trust God and know that God will never take you where the grace of God can't keep you, God won't place you where God is not already prepared for you. God will never leave you or forsake you. God won't send you somewhere and then, yes, surround you like and then drop you like it's hot. God won't call you into ministry partially. Ain't no room for lazy and trifling. Like half-stepping, competing loyalties, having arrogant, doing stuff to be seen. Folks, choose you this day whom you serve. serve. You can't serve God and the world too. If you are all ready to move 
from bringing a rich young ruler wrapped up in you and are willing to be obedient to God's will and God's way, God has need of you. God has need of a few brothers and sisters who are, who are about the kingdom's business of serving others because it is the God thing to do. Loving others because it is the God thing to do. Giving not deontologically or duty bound because it is the God thing to do. Nobody should tell you what, when, where, and how to do when you are doing the God thing of building up God's empire of grace. Anybody here ever had competing loyalties torn between what you love and your love for God? Just when you think you can't make it without that job, you get a pink slip. That fancy car gets wrecked, living the comfortable lifestyle, then you get sick. That kid you bagged up, bragged about now drug at it. That spouse you put ahead of God cheats on you. That beachfront property gets hit hard by a hurricane. Beloved, can I tell you a secret? When we are truly ready to ask the question and have decided to serve the Lord with gladness, when things get stirred up in our lives to where you just are not satisfied, God will be God in your life and make you show sure enough a way out of no way. Oh, I never have seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. And just when there is no paycheck and, and, and people start being benevolent and your hours are cut back at work and minimum wage causes maximum rage because you got feet, children to feed and, and clothes and to shelter and no food, God shows up and shows up for those who are willing to go all the way with God. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. Just when you have to choose and trust in God. But for heaven's sake, don't act like Peter who said, look at here, Jesus, we have given up everything to follow you. And now you ain't even acknowledging us. Peter had an attitude and a problem because he thought his sacrifice should be acknowledged. Peter wanted Pastor Jesus to thank him publicly. Peter suffered from what about me syndrome, but here comes Jesus. Or surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or husband or children or job for the sake of the kingdom and the liberating gospel who has not received a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children and land with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Beloved, we got to be careful how we treat each other because you don't know who you will need to bring you a cup of water. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. We have an example of humility who broke down barriers of stratification, who showed us how to pivot with the least and the lost and all points in between. If Jesus didn't act uppity, why do we think we should? Jesus had the keys to the kingdom freely gave, and we don't want folks to have the keys to our church. Help me, Holy Ghost. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in every respect, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Beloved, the road is rough. And every now and again, the going gets tough. And I declare the hills are hard to climb. But I started out a long time ago, and there is still no doubt in my mind. I have decided to make Jesus my choice. Will you do the same today? Let me just say that it is difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it doesn't matter if an eye of the needle is really the eye of a sewing instrument or the eye of the needle is a passageway carved out by erosion in the mountains. It's still difficult for a camel to get through. 
But it is much easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for those of us who have stubborn characteristics of rich, which means self-centered. Young equals immature, a ruler with issues of control. It ain't easy. Folks will talk about you, but it's worth it. So stop competing with yourself. Conflicts within, take up your cross and follow. Stop holding on to stuff and follow. Stop making excuses and follow the way, the truth, and the life. Stop feeling sorry for your situation and follow. When you're ready to follow Jesus, God stands ready. You have to decide and ask the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then the answer is list. God is even asking us, what can I do? to make you feel secure. Remove all of your doubts so that you know for sure that you are the apple of God's eye. Fulfillment of God's dream. God declares time will show the value of just what you mean to the kingdom. You're more precious than silver. You're more precious than diamond rings or anything. Life wouldn't mean a thing if we didn't have God's love beside us here to guide us through. Well, it's good to know that you do. I know just how you feel, but God's love for us is real. It got real traveling down 44 generations to be born to a virgin named Mary. God's love got real when he was wounded for our transgressions, rules for our iniquities. God's love got real when accused of loving radically, inclusively, and sentenced to die a criminal's death by execution on the cross. God's love got real when they hung him high and stretched him wide and pierced him in his side as grace and mercy oozed out to saturate the earth and sanctify our souls. God's love got real when placed in a borrowed tomb, resting all evening on Friday, laying there all Saturday. But early one Sunday morning, death became life and resurrected hope. Real love broke free again, and now time has revealed from everlasting to everlasting that God is able to lead us through the difficult passages of life and the decisions that we must make. But you have to make the decision to take up your cross and follow. I don't know about you, but I decided a long time ago, though I will never wonder, I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, beloved, he is real. Is he real in your soul today? Has he washed away all of your sins? Jesus' love just keeps bubbling over. Has he done so much for you that you are ready to decide? Can you feel the love just bubbling over in your soul? Beloved, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Accept God today, wherever you might be. And know that God is with you.